helping people cope with and overcome life's challenges. This is Life Transformations with Michael Hart, Canadian Certified Counselor and Award-Winning Psychotherapist. Welcome to another episode of the Life Transformation Show. I'm Denise Hart, your co-host. And with me in studio today is psychotherapist Michael Hart, who is here to share his expert insights on the topic, How to Heal Trauma Bonding, Part 2. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Denise. It is such a pleasure to be back with you today to continue this journey, this discussion about how to heal trauma bonding. I see so many people that come to me in my practice as a psychotherapist or in relationships where they are trapped in that they are bonded together with their abusers and they just don't know how to break free. And in this show today, we are going to be sharing important tips of how to free yourself if you're in a trauma bond situation. Before we dive into today's topic, I want to remind our listeners that you can find out more about our show and the work we do at elimcounselingministry.com. It's a great resource for those seeking additional guidance and support. So, Michael, last time we laid the foundation and today we are going deeper. It's all about awareness, understanding the signs of trauma bonding, and empowering our listeners to recognize them in their lives. Absolutely. We're on a mission to shed light on the path to freedom from these invisible chains that may have held people captive for a very long time. And speaking of breaking chains... Last week's show on how to heal trauma bonding part one contains valuable insights on trauma bonding and is key information for finding freedom. So if you missed last week's show, you can find it on our YouTube channel. Just search Elim Counseling on YouTube. So Michael, what would you say are the crucial first steps in breaking trauma bonding? As you rightfully said, Denise, last week's show is very important because we laid the foundation and we outlined the signs of trauma bonding. So I think an important first step is to know the signs. And last week we talked about Samson as a biblical example. And we said how he ignored the signs of trauma bonding. And Samson also seemed to have this tendency to find himself in situations where he's bonded to women who would deceive him. And he didn't know the signs, and as a result, it cost him his life. We also said that you should familiarize yourself with the strategies that is used to create trauma bond. And in last week's show, show, we looked at a number of those signs, including gas lighting. And we see gas lighting in the example of Samson. Samson's first wife also manipulated him using gas lighting tactics. So in Judges 14, 16, for example, we read, Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, You hate me, you don't love me, you have given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. So she is crying to Samson because she had made a deal with her people, the Philistines, to find the answer to a riddle that Samson had given that they couldn't find the answer to as a way to cheat him out of the bet that he had made with them. And as the story unfolded, we see that she did betray Samson. So he's bonded to this woman who is using manipulation to get him to trust her when in fact she's not trustworthy. But we see the very same thing with Samson's second wife, Delilah, in Judges 16, 15. And this, it's almost identical to what the first wife said. Let me read. Then she said to him, Oh, can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the ter- third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your strength. So, so she is complaining to Samson again that he doesn't trust her. And as a result of that, he confided in her and he was again betrayed. So it's very important that if you're in a trauma bond situation that you familiarize yourself 
with the strategies that are used to keep you in that situation. And I don't have time to go over all the ones we covered in last week's shows, but I think these first two steps are very crucial. Know the signs of that indicate that you're in a trauma bond relationship. And two, familiarize yourself with the strategies used to create trauma bond. Well, Michael, we're here to help any Samson that is listening to this show today. So last week, we explored in detail the strategies that create trauma bonds. And you mentioned a few briefly just now, and it's been eye-opening to understand these tactics. So if you missed last week's show, I would strongly suggest listening to it as well. One of my favorite parts of last week's show was your explanation that there is a demonic element to trauma bond. Yes, in last week's show, I said that people who use trauma bond, sometimes they are not very educated people, but they have manipulation. Uh, they, they, they use manipulation in such a highly sophisticated way that is beyond themselves. And I think that there are demonic entities behind their, their manipulation and the strategies that they are using, the mind control strategies that they use. And we know that demons are intelligent. We see in Matthew 8, verse 28 and 29, that the demons in that passage, they knew who Jesus was and they knew that there was a day coming when they were going to be tormented. It's as if they, they have the, their PhD in, in theology and many of the, 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 the rabbis in those days didn't know who Jesus was and didn't know that there was a common judgment for demons. But these demons already knew that. So I think that the, the, the sophistication of the control and the mind manipulation has a, a spiritual element to it. And in last week's show, we said, if you are in a trauma bond situation, one of the things that you should do is to have deliverance prayer to help to free yourself from what you're going through. Because there is a psychological component, but there is also a spiritual component. Interested indeed, Michael. Now, our listeners might be wondering, what's the next crucial step in finding freedom from trauma bonds? So what's the next step, Michael? The next step is to count the cost and count the cost on your health, the cost it's having on your health. Being in an emotionally abusive relationship can lead to chronic stress, anxiety, and even physical health issues like high blood pressure. It's crucial to recognize that your well-being is on the line and this awareness can serve as a powerful motivator to break free. And I would also say that count the cost on your mental health. This toxic type of a relationship is causing you to be depressed. It's damaging your self-esteem. So acknowledging the impact on your mental health is also a crucial part of counting the cost. But a third aspect of counting the cost has to do count the cost on your, your, your self-development and your self-growth. Trauma bonding can be devastating to your self-esteem. So recognizing this cost is essential to become motivated. So embracing personal growth and self-improvement can be an empowering way to rebuild your life. And if you're in a trauma-bonded relationship, you're in a stagnant situation. So begin to educate yourself, begin to, to read about trauma bonding and ways in which you can develop and grow as a person. This is crucial because when you're in a trauma bonding type of relationship, you are stagnant and your self-esteem is being eroded by the abuse that you're under. So Michael, you have shed light on something truly profound, how trauma bonding can act as a significant roadblock to personal growth and development. So after recognizing the cost and understanding the significance of personal development, what's the next strategy our listeners should be aware of in their journey to overcoming trauma bonding? I think it's a crucial step for that if you're in a trauma bond relationship that you 
create a new vision for your life. You have been in a lot of negativity, a lot of ne abuse, and you are suffering emotionally. But that's not where you want to spend the rest of your life. And so I think it's important to create a new vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And so a vision is a crucial step. What would you like to see your life be like in five years from today? Write that out. And having a vision does important psychological things like shifting your focus. So when you're trapped in a trauma bond type of relationship, your focus is often fixated on the toxic relationship and the abusers and the abuser. Your life revolves around their approval, their moods and their demands. And so creating a vision is like shifting the spotlight from the darkness of the current relationship you're in to the brightness of the future. It's about redirecting your attention towards your own goals, dreams, and desires. So you spoke about creating a new vision and shifting that spotlight. It's like finding a new purpose, a purpose that's entirely your own, filled with goals, dreams, and desires, Michael. Absolutely. And a, a new vision also prov provides a clear sense of purpose and direction. It's like setting a compass that guides you towards a better and more fulfilling future. And the sense of purpose can be a powerful motivator to break free from the toxic relationship as it reminds you that there is a world beyond the abuse and the pain that you're suffering. And trauma bond often distort your self-identity and self-worth. So creating a new vision helps you reinvent your identity on your own terms. It allows you to redefine who you are apart from the negative labels and judgment that is imposed on you by your abuser. So I know this is, sounds very simple, but it's a very powerful step. Take the time to sit and to write out your vision, because by so doing, you are setting psychological processes in place that is going to help you to break free from the chains that is keeping you bound in that relationship. So the idea of reinventing one's identity, especially in the wake of trauma bonding, is truly remarkable. So after reinventing our identity to overcoming trauma bonding, what's the next step? The next step is to start journaling about your experiences and emotions. Journaling is a powerful tool to combat gaslighting and manipulation tactics that are often used by abusers. So by writing down your experiences, you're also keeping a record of things that the abuser will deny that it ever happened or will make you feel as if it's all in your head. You can go back to your journal at a future time and you can look at what you wrote a month ago and say, I'm not going crazy. This did happen. This is actually what he said. But beside that, journaling also builds resilience. The research out there shows that if you journal even about the bad things that have happened in your life, it's helping you to cope. It's helping you to work out your emotions in such a way that you do not fall apart and it, and the emotions do not end up resulting in mental illnesses that is going to cause you to be a shadow of yourself. So journaling is a very simple step again, but it's a very important step to do. That is such an important point. We often want to ignore our pain and even deceive ourselves into thinking they are not there. But what I hear you're saying is that writing about our pain is healthy and it also protects against gas gaslighting. So what about telling others what you are going through? 
That's a very good point, Denise. I think that's what a point I would label breaking the silence. But this can be challenging, especially if you've been made to feel ashamed or guilty for the state of your relationship. But it's important to remember that you have nothing to be ashamed of. The abuser's actions are not your fault, even though you have been made to feel that being abused is because of something that you have done or something that you have said, it is not your fault. And so speaking out and speaking to others about what you are going through is a very powerful step towards recovery and healing. You have been even made to feel that Everyone will know it's your fault if you speak to anyone. But you see, that's part of the manipulation. Abusers often tell you what people have said about you and what they think about you, but it's all part of the strategy to keep you trapped. So break free from this mindset and begin to speak to friends and family members about what you are going through. Michael will be right back. You have been listening to the Live Transformation Show where award-winning psychotherapist Michael Hart of Elim Counseling Services has been speaking on the topic How to Heal the Trauma Bond Part 2. You can find out more about us at elimcounselingministry.com or by calling 1-877-204-2914, where you can also make a donation to this Christ-centered ministry. Your donations help us to stay on the air and to provide subsidized counseling to those who can't afford it. Back. To Michael. And I think it's also important to get trusted third party opinion on your relationship. So seeking the opinion of others will help you to realize that what your, the relationship that you're in, that it's bad. And regardless of what the abuser is telling you, it's not a good relationship. People who are in trauma-bonded relationship often begin to doubt their reality, and they may be made to feel that the, real, that the relationship is just wonderful. But if you have the opinion of others and you tell them what you're going through, and they begin to say to you, this is terrible, you should get out of that relationship, then you will know that what you're going through, it's bad and it's not in your head, and you are more, you will be more motivated to leave. And I have this principle that I call the rule of three, and it's about getting the opinion of three, three unbiased persons whom you will sit with and just tell your story and hear what they say about it. And if you speak to three people and they're each telling you that this is a bad relationship and you should get out of it, then you know you're not going crazy, that the relationship is not wonderful, and that you need to take steps to break the chains. Michael, the notion of seeking a third party opinion, especially through the rule of three, is quite intriguing. I like the idea of consulting with trusted friends, family, and professionals. It's like building a support network around you, isn't it? So what's the next step, Michael? The next step is to begin rebuilding your self-esteem. And one strategy that you can use for this is to start by creating what I call a self-affirmation list. And in this list, you're going to be writing down 20 positive things about yourself. And maybe you have been made to feel so worthless that when you hear about 20 things, the first thing that come in your mind is 20. I can't think of 20 things. Things, but begin to think about your say, your your value as a friend. Think about your value as a worker. Think about your value as a daughter, uh, as a sister. And as you begin to think about those qualities, you will see that it's not hard to find 20 positive things about yourself. But the secret to making this work is to do it daily, make it a daily practice. And so when you begin to have this self-affirmation list, you over time, you're going to be shifting your mindset and you're going to be fostering great confidence and self-compassion. 
So the idea of reinforcing self-worth through self-affirmation, that's such a beautiful concept. So now shifting gears a bit, I've read somewhere that helping others can boost one's self-esteem. Can you shed light on how volunteering to help others can also play a role in breaking free from trauma bonding? Yes, absolutely. That's such a good point because I, I think uh, we often lo look down or make volunteering seem as if it's just giving off your time. But volunteering does a number of things for people who are in trauma bond relationship. One is that it shifts their focus from the negative Number two is that others get to witness their value and their worth through the acts of kindness that they, that they do. And so when you do these acts of service and you're reminded of your worth and your inherent goodness in helping others, this can counteract the negative conditioning that you may have experienced in the abusive relationship. Great points, Michael. So this idea of volunteering seemed to be an antidote to the emptiness and worthlessness that often accompany trauma bonding. Absolutely. So can, uh, last week, you talked about isolating the victim as a tactic that the abusers use. Can you talk a little bit more in detail in this show about the dangers of isolation and how to avoid it? Yes. When a person is isolated, the dangers are that they begin to lack perspective. They begin to be confused because all they have is the information of the abuser. And another danger is that there is the deepening of emotional wounds. When you're isolated, your mind has the tendency to just dwell and focus on your pain. And isolation keeps you under the abuser's influence. So these are all great dangers that should inspire you to get out of isolation and begin to interact with others. So now that you have reflected on the dangers of isolation and how it can keep individuals trapped, can we now talk about the psychological benefits of being part of a community and why it is a powerful tool to break trauma bonding? That's a, that's a very good question. And I think the, the first psychological benefit is that being in a community gives you a sense of belonging. Whether it's a church group, a support group, or a volunteer organization that you become a part of, there is this sense of belonging. And you're no longer alone in your struggles. And this connection can be incredibly comforting. And also being in a, in a supportive community can also give you the sense of shared experiences as you're part of a community where you're hearing the story of others as well. But then there's also the psychological benefit of empowerment. Empowerment. When you're part of a community, the fact that you're supported and you're cared for and you're validated also helps you to rebuild your self-esteem and self-worth. And not to mention the psychological benefits of support and encouragement. And the most important thing is for uh, the person to have a safe community. So, Michael, what's the next step? The next step, I would say, is to seek professional help. A professional can help you identify the root issues that cause you to go into trauma bonding relationship. And also a, a, a counselor will be able to tailor make a plan to suit your needs and circumstances. And it also creates a safe environment for you to process and talk about your em emotions. And it also can give you healing strategies to help you heal from what you have been through. So a trained therapist doesn't just offer support. They provide the tools and insights that will help to reclaim uh, one's self-worth. I really love that, Michael. So let's talk a little bit about scriptures now that can help someone in trauma bonding to break free. 
this is such an important step because I think having scriptures and knowing what the scripture says and to overcome the lie of the enemy. So one of the lies that the, the enemy of your soul will tell you or your abusers will tell you is that you will never get past this emotional event or terrible circumstance that you're in. But God's word tells us that he shall cover you with his feathers and that under his wings you shall take refuge and that his truth shall be your shield and buckler. So that's from Psalm 91, verse 4 to 6. So his truth, not the lies of the enemy. And another lie is that God doesn't care about your emotions. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30 tells us that God calls us, Come unto me, all he who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And another lie from the enemy is that your future is hopeless. But God's word says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Another lie is that God is far away from you. But we see from Psalm 34, 18, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So thank you so much, Michael, for engaging in this discussion on how to heal, how to heal trauma bonding part two. Tune in next Monday morning at 9.30 when we will be discussing how to support someone who is grieving. If you missed any part of today's show, you can find the episode posted on Elim Counseling Services' YouTube channel. Please consider making a donation to help our Christ-centered ministry. Your contribution will directly impact those seeking support and guidance. Until next time, I'm your co-host, Denise Hart. And Michael Hart, praying together that God would bless you in all your relationships and keep you sound in mind and pure in heart.